course have sort of uh, wondered about, but it's hard to really put it in words, which is what's the kind of historical context of this course, or are we making history in this course, or what's the relative impact and importance of the course, and where is it going, where has it been, all that kind of stuff. So one play, way to put that is the place of Lab MP590 in history and that's kind of a puzzle. As Winston Churchill said, it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So that's what he said about Russian involvement in the Second World War. <laughs> it also applies here. So um, what is the situation that we're in? I think in the past, I felt it was clear that we were so small in comparison to all competition that it really didn't matter what we did, that the competition was crushing and that we, 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 we were just this small entity out there doing stuff. But then a number of things happened. The big entity, Singularity University, the CEO resigned and they, they did a major um, downsizing, they completely changed their orientation. And around that time, I discovered that in a very real sense, we're ahead of them. We're ahead of them in the subjects taught and in the consistency of our message. <laughs> consistency of message is kind of an important thing. So like there are four subjects that we routinely talk about in this course that they seem to religiously avoid. So quantum biology, quantum supremacy, the idea that quantum computers could do something to show that it's, it's a whole new world out there and that you know, it's no going back and so on. Digital personas for non celebrities, model instances of oneself for ordinary people, not for people who are filling stadiums and want to do more than one stadium a night, but ordinary people who just want to do more than one thing at, at a time. And finally, single cell transcriptomics, this human cell atlas project. So all four of those things Every time Singularity University has a summit, they never talk about those things. And once they even came close, they, they announced that there would be a lecture on quantum biology, but that lecture just never happened, so it didn't happen. So the other thing about it is that <coughs> when, when you listen to their really big meetings, the summits, you often find somebody saying, well, you know, really, we're not a university and we don't believe in the singularity. So where does that leave you? It's like double negatives that what the heck are we? We're calling ourselves Singularity University, but we don't believe in the singularity. We're not a university. So, and it seems to me that, that, that in, in this course, it, the, 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 the world view, the universe view, whatever you want to call it, is actually more consistent than it is with them, even though they have hundreds of people and we, we, we have two or three. So time will tell whether our course will change the world, but what's interesting is in little ways we've already changed it. You may know that the Finnish government at a free AI course for their entire population. Finland is this little nimble country, and they intended to be ahead of all other countries in AI by training the, the, their um, citizens in artificial intelligence. And part of that course said, don't worry about a thing because Self-improving AI will need human help for each self-improvement step. 
So like when the self-improving AI wants to increase its capabilities, it'll have to come to some human committee and say, so can we increase our capabilities? And the humans will sit around and say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. That is the most ridiculous thing. There's not a computer scientist in the world that thinks that's how self-improving AI works. But that's what the Finnish government AI course website said. And so we did this video about it, and within a few days, that changed. Now, I don't know that we were the cause of the change, but temporarily, it, it, and several other things happened like that. Yuval Noah Harari, I've been very interested in his books, you probably know them, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And there are ways to kind of indirect contact, indirectly contact him, and I realized that he was like falling on his face every time that he speaks, because he was saying, well, as a historian, it's just my role to point out the dangers. I have no responsibility for fixing anything or, you know, offering any solutions. And then he'd go on and talk about how you would fix things and, and what solutions there might be. So he was completely shooting himself in the foot every time by saying, you know, my only responsibility is to point out the dangers. So I communicated with him, or we, we did, and that also got changed in less than 24 hours. He no longer says that. So, um, and the third thing is, everybody in my field gets a magazine, a free magazine called The Pathologist. And it is supported by people who create and sell digital pathology products. And they want to comfort people so that they can buy such products without worrying about, you know, AI taking over or any bad things happening. So there, there was a completely fictional world that was created in that magazine First of all, that says everything about pathology is pretty and appealing and, you know, every graphic is, is like immersive and your endorphins start flowing as soon as you see a pathology picture and giving the impression that all of pathology is that way. There's no blood and guts, there's nothing off-putting ever, it's just totally great. And so we had some issues with that. And starting about January 2019, they went to completely truthful presentations and <laughs> dramatic reversal. So anyway, we, 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 we have changed those things. And we don't know that the Just Machines company, which owns the rights to the content of this course, uh, will ever be profitable. But what is clear, I, I think after my weekend talk with Tori Sheldon, is that um, from a medical anthropology point of view, this course is unique and interesting and one could do analysis and, and papers on it and it's very productive from that point of view. So this is Tori Sheldon. So for 10 years, 1997 to 2007, I ran something called NKF Cyber Nephrology at a budget of about 400,000 a year and a lot of full-time professional staff. And at the end of that 10-year period, the CEO of the National Kidney Foundation told me two things that they could no longer justify sending this much money outside of the U U.S. They raised most of their money going door to door at homes in, in the U.S. and they weren't saying to people, by the way, you know, we're sending 400,000 a year to Canada. So they figured they couldn't do that anymore. They could no longer support us. But the CEO said, you're a pretty clever guy. We want you to keep on doing everything that you're doing. So we're not like shutting down anything. We just want you to find a way to do it without us giving you any money. So students were the obvious way to do that. 
So we had all these templates for the professional staff, and um, so it just seemed like a fairly obvious thing to give students these same roles, and so pay them hardly anything, but they're doing something no other student in the world is, is, is doing, like running a quarter million dollar medical meeting and lots of other high profile things like that. And so Tori was the first person to do that, and uh, she then mentored a lot of other students, and the students in this course, and, and the students helping with the course and so on, are, are sort of part of that legacy. But of course, there's a much longer <coughs> legacy because uh, back in January 1973, when I was an intern, I was a PGY-1 trainee at Johns Hopkins, and ordinarily such people are so intimidated by the situation <laughs> that they're in, they don't like try to do extra stuff, but I did something. Um, I, I got five Oberlin students for their winter term project, and they came and did research with me in that uh, January. And uh, so my mentor, Robert Heptonstall, the most famous kidney pathologist, was very impressed by this activity of mine of importing students while I was still in my first year training in pathology and urged me to continue it. And basically that's what I've then done for the next 47 years. So uh, believe it or not, we have with us today one of those initial students, Greg Allen, who's, who's been, done quite well. He has been since 1996, the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of the EFRA Corps and was one of the original students from January 1973 and I might say the only student to completely fill out the feedback form, which is very impressive, showed some kind of due diligence on his part and he joins us today by Skype. Okay, so I'm now going to get out of the PowerPoint and let's admit I'm not done. Yeah, okay, this is looking promising. Let me now go to Skype and we should be fine. There is Skype. Yay! Okay. So, Greg, uh, <laughs> that, that, oh, that's... Good afternoon, uh, Kim and, and uh, your class, your class there. I'm, 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 I'm happy to be uh, joining you today. I'm, I'm much more out of curiosity probably than anything else, but I, I did want to make sure that you know I didn't look too much different from your your <laughs> professor there, and uh, just happened to have yeah, uh, but not quite the, the same vintage duffer that you have, Kim. But uh, yeah, I thought I thought you'd get a kick out of it. No, it, it's uh, anyway. very appealing and uh, strategically. Yeah. Very and, and by, the, by the way, I'm joining joining you from uh, my home in uh, just outside of Franklin, Tennessee, uh, which is right near Nashville, Tennessee. For some of you to know, mm -hmm. some of you, Sydney, USA. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Tell us what 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 are your most potent memories of, of, of that month in uh, January 1973 and and was it just a little blip in your well-being quickly forgotten or or did it have any lasting in, impact? Um, you know, I think it. Uh, well, first of all, there there was you know the much of the day to day, uh, as I recall, was in the lab. Uh, as you mentioned, we were doing surgery on white rats, yeah. tying off re tying off renal arteries, if I remember correctly. Um, so that was that was my first exposure to that that type of what I'll call industrial strength research uh, in the lab. But uh, and I do recall that uh, pretty vividly. Um, I think the other thing, 
one of the other things I remember is that we we would occasionally have an opportunity to go to the amphitheater and you know observe surgery. I, mm -hmm. I did see a a cardiac uh, you know open heart surgery uh, event, which turns out I'd actually had uh, uh, atrial septal defect repair hmm. in 1961 at Mayo Clinic, but of course had never really been, you know, sort of an eyewitness to someone else having what I think ended up being a triple bypass. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so again, those were, again, I was still a college student. Uh, those were um, uh, events that I remember clearly, partly because I knew that at that point, I was beginning to have a fairly clear idea that I might like to go to medical school. Uh, I had not been intending to do that through through much of my freshman and sophomore years, um, but but that was a, that was a, the ju my junior year, uh, January of my junior year, and um, it, it gave me some confidence that you know this might be something I could actually do. <laughs> so. Even though, even though you, you and I did did not have direct patient exposure at that time, we were again, you know, working with your um, very cooperative rats. Yes. Yes. So. Well, you know, a lot a lot of interesting things happened about those rats. When I was on psychiatry, it was a kind of crucial time for the rat experiments. So I would disappear down to the animal course fairly frequently. <laughs> and what the psychiatrists who were training me noticed was that I was in the hospital a lot. And so they said, we're so terribly sorry that you and your wife are having problems because you're never going home. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> I started to explain about the rats and I thought, <laughs> Never believe that story. <laughs> they're, they're, they're trying to think of a simple way to explain the fact that I'm often in, you know, the hospital when the other students aren't. Yeah, and um, when when I became chair here, it was quite interesting that I psychologically felt that wet bench research or animal research must always be a part of my life in order for me to respect myself when I look in the mirror in the morning. But my, uh, my superior, the dean, didn't feel like that. At one point he said, you know, your um, you know, conceptual work that doesn't require wet bench stuff for killing any rats or rabbits is actually highly successful. And, uh, you know, are you sure you need to maintain a, a wet bench lab? And so I thought, well, <laughs> maybe not. But that, that, was, that, that was like a shocking suggestion, you know. It's, it, it's like a, you know, clinician stopping seeing patients. For me, no longer operating on those animals uh, when, with, with, was just a kind of uh, you know, dramatic change, but I, yeah, it was something that you know, eventually came. But the rats were remarkably resistant to you know, infection. You might think when you study how to do surgery sterilely, that what we were doing, just just our ordinary hands and no gloves or anything, right. that the rats would all become septic and die, but none of them did. You know, they're they're such hardy beasts. Yeah. I remember that they, they didn't seem to be bothered by that at all. There was no sterile technique whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so. there 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 were some remarkable lessons there. Um, I suppose that if, if rats did routinely become infected from what we were doing, that a lot of day-to-day -day trauma that they experienced would probably also infect them, and they, they wouldn't be as highly successful in populating the world with fellow rats as they have, have been. So, yeah. So one, one of the things that I wondered about 
was um, was there any hint, um, any evidence of, of my having an interest in futurism? I I don't think so. I I don't think I I was much of a futurist back then, or or maybe just a little tiny bit. So uh, I don't, I don't recall seeing that side of you. Yeah, yeah. So I you were, think you were heads heads down, get get the work done, and by the way, I'm the low man on the totem pole here. Uh, and 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 you know, you you had a lot of people telling you what to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that uh, it, it was a completely practical medical experience without a lot of uh, speculative content. Like now, this whole whole course is about speculative content, right? Things that we're not sure will really occur that, that we're predicting, like you know, machines being smarter than individual humans nine years from now, and the whole human race in uh, 2045, uh, and you know, machine replacement of human labor, and all sorts of other things. Um, Various kinds of uh, existential risk, things to wipe wipe out the whole human race. I think back in '73, I, I I wasn't thinking that big. I, I was sort of thinking rat by rat, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah I, think, I think so. You were worrying about having some impact on our understanding of hypertension. Yes. At, yeah. At that time. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, and uh, kidney failure were my two big interests. So, um, I think that that's right. And what about respect for publishing papers? Um, because I I don't think I I emphasize that very much either. And the reason that makes me think that. So Pamela Quarles, one of the other students there, the only paper she has published in her entire physician career was the one she wrote with me, based on the work we, we were doing then. I guess it was so completely satisfying that she just never found the, the, right. the, the need to write any other papers. And uh, so, a number of, of the early students fall in that category, that, 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 that they have very successful careers, but very few published papers. So I, I guess I would say that later on, um, scholarly writing and publishing papers was, was quite important for me, but maybe not not at the beginning, or not, you know, consciously. So, right. right. Well, I, you know, I, that may that may be. I, although I was under the impression, then if not later, uh, when I was a medical student myself, that that in most academic university settings like that, that there was a great deal of pressure on those who were, you know, had signed up for a research course or, or track. Yes. So to speak, there was a great deal of pressure uh, for for even junior faculty and their uh, trainees to you know, crank papers out. Um, yeah. So I figured that that was just part of the culture there at Hopkins. Um, yeah. And and again, for for myself, of course, I took a my career and my training took a, a career that was distinctly academic. Uh, uh, although I have spent uh, some number of years uh, teaching uh, some basic principles of healthcare finance and delivery to uh, students at Vanderbilt uh, mm -hmm. Medical School right. uh, over a period of about 10 to 15 years. Uh, but again, didn't publish papers in that, in that time and, uh, you know, was, was really much more attuned to the, to the practical impact of both how we practice medicine and how we pay for it in this country. Right. And the, 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 those, were, those were the areas where I set about to do something. Yes, yeah. Well, I think that we often talk in this course about when the content of the course will reach the mainstream. 
And you can argue when that will be and what that exactly means, but what is your impression of the, the content of the course? So are we just like fooling around with meaningless concepts or are, are, are these really big picture things that will impact the whole human race big time or where, where, where do you sort of sit on those issues? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I qualify my comments by saying that I think I need to learn a bit more about the content. You've sent me some YouTube videos and some, uh, some background information, but I, I think I'd like to understand the, the course material a bit better. But, I, no, I, I, think, I think it's, um, uh, it's leading edge, for, for, you know, no question about it, uh, in terms of, 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 of you know, grab, thinking about now problems that we know we're going to be grappling uh, within 5 to 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's worth, um, I think it's worth that worth that effort. Given especially everybody in your classroom there uh, is a native user of of technology, right? You and I are not. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and so they, you know, that the, the understanding of, of that and where it's leading strikes me as a really good thing for for young people to. Um, to be talking about uh, right with, with oldsters like you and me. Yeah. Now speaking of that, next Tuesday, uh, David Pierce, who's a very famous uh, philosopher from the UK, is uh, speaking with us by Skype, and he loves to interact with the students, and we spend most of the time with the students talking to him. So I'd like the students to kind of practice that. So what do you like to Come up and look him in the eye and talk to him a bit. Come on, what's what's the worst? Where's the good habit? <laughs> okay. So yeah. So, so just there you go. Hello. Greetings. Greetings. How are you? Yeah. Good afternoon. Um. I came up here. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's sort of ask ask me anything, or you know, he he can ask you or something. So you want to tell him why you took the course? And yeah, um, I thought this course was super interesting. So um, my I had a friend a few years back who was telling me I was in my second year in my undergrad. He was telling me about this class um, and about Dr. Solas and just about how interesting the content was. And I'm in computing uh -huh. science, and I thought, no, oh, this is perfect. Um, you know, uh, a class where I get to talk about the high-level stuff, about what is coming in the future, and um, why it's important. Um, and I thought that was incredibly interesting. Computing science and medicine, I think, is, it, they, they go together so well. Um, and the technology improvements we're going to have in medicine in the future is, is just going to be really amazing, and I'm super excited for it. I want to learn as much about it as I can. Yeah, good. I understand that. Um, you, you know, one uh, just an observation about your the technology advances. Uh, you know, with, and you guys are really talking about uh, concepts that are probably foreign to most uh, current day physicians or even young physicians, but. Uh, well, you know, one of the things that, I, that, that, that may help to make uh, some of my career successful was the exploding technology in medical imaging uh, and the fact that, that when I trained uh, at a time that was four or five years after Dr. Solis, um, we still did not have first generation uh, CT. We had uh, barely had ultrasound at, by the end of the, the 70s. CT came along, MRI uh, mid to late 80s, uh, and then it, and then basically the uses of these technologies literally exploded in, in the 90s and 2000s. And what happened was that physicians like myself were totally unprepared for knowing what to do with this information. It, we had we hadn't really trained for it, 
And so uh, one of the things that that, 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 that technology explosion uh, drove, in addition to patient benefit, was a, a lot of extra and uh, uh, unnecessary use of those technologies because people didn't really understand them. And uh, that became part of the work that we did at, at the company called Med Solutions, where we were helping to educate the practicing physicians about you know, what, what was really out there, what, what it was useful for and, and not. So uh, again, it's kind of a small snippet of, of what happens when technology explodes. But again, you have, you have both you know, an incredible benefit and in the, in the, the forward progress in medicine, but you also have things that uh, you know, can, you know, can pull, it, pull it down and drain resources from the system. Um, which is again you know, where where I've spent quite a bit of time here the last twenty years or so. And yeah, but anyway, it's good to. And you're good talking to hear you, but, a lot about yeah. um, like so you're saying med medical imaging as was definitely overused a lot because everyone wanted to use it. Cause it's amazing technology, and yeah. what I'm super excited for is all of the little things. Well, data mostly the you know the the, the smart watches that collect all your biometric yeah. data. The smart toilets, which are just coming to market now, which analyzes your analyzes your waste um, and can can make super super um, informed decisions because of all the little amounts of data it collects. Um, so that's the the super interesting part for me. And um, medical imaging, I guess, is a different part because that mainly for now has to stay within the hospitals. But even with that. If we're able to actually use that data for medical imaging, um, the possibilities for that and uh, learning how to identify certain diseases and certain cancers is, is super interesting. I love it. Yeah, yeah sure. No, no question about it. And, and again, the, um, the, 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 the advances you're talking about around personal health, data, collecting personal health data, I and mean, again, that's that's a phenomenon, really, just the last ten years, mm -hmm. um, where you know all kinds of devices now are. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a, uh, uh, a cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, I had one a problem with that, and come to find out, there's there was a little device, basically a disc that I would just put my fingers on, and it would it would create effectively. Um, uh, a rhythm strip, an EKG, if you will, on the heart, and I could send it with, within you know minutes to my cardiologist. Um, I mean, this is literally something that didn't exist ten years ago. Um, and, and again, these these are you know, very exciting things, just like you're talking about. Um, my sense is your the course that you you guys are uh, attending is also looking out way way out in front of. Uh, you know what's at the other end of artificial intelligence and so on. So, which is again not a place where many of us spend very much time. But I think it's exciting that you are. Yeah, I honestly I like to look at what's going to happen in, in fifty years for me, right? Mm -hmm. And what what's the, what's the future is going to look like then? And that's that's what I love. You, you know what a, you know what a tricorder is, right? Uh, tri I don't know if I've heard of that. Tricorder. <laughs> From uh, yeah, yeah, Star yeah. Trek. Oh no, I haven't. I haven't actually watched Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tricorder is the device that they're using on Star Trek, back back in the or the, the television show Star Trek, to essentially diagnose, give it over people and, and diagnose mm. them, and in some cases treat them with with this device. Yeah. Um, I thought you would have heard of that. Um, no, I've been, been meaning to watch Star Trek. I think it's something that I would enjoy, but I just haven't sat down and watched it. Yeah. Um, right, well, maybe we'll... Uh, Glad you're enjoying the course. Yeah, nice talking to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Talking Emily, do you want to? Sure. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, my name is hi. Emily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm one of the teaching assist assistants for this course, but um, I took this class last fall. Um, I'm really interested in uh, medicine and the role that 
um, technology is going to play in the future in terms of um, precision in like a patient's diagnosis or um, a patient's um, drug treatment or something like that, specifically in like cancer and cancer treatments. Um, I'm really interested in um, immunotherapy and um, CAR T cell uh, therapy that's, and the research that's happening right now. I think it's really interesting and um, if you were to make a really like uh, big discovery, I think it could be really groundbreaking in um, the future of diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I totally agree with you. I think you know one of the things that we were working on in, in the company that I um, left just a year or so ago was, you know, how to take some of these new cutting cutting edge you know, technologies and, and techniques, in, especially in person, what we would call personalized medicine, yeah. that has a, it has a crossover with the genetic piece with other traditional forms of diagnosis. Um, yeah, how do, how do we make sense of that, you know, uh, in a way that's uh, not the same old, same old, or, you know, you know the sort of uh, testing, you know, one test leads to another cascade kind of thing, um, and, and all of that's exciting. The CAR T, uh, you know, the treatment approaches, again, all very exciting stuff. Um, I, I think the one, um, the one thing I, I would, this is not something that's going to concern you now, and it's, uh, it is a concern in the United States, probably more so than in Canada, but the question is, you know, some of these technologies are very expensive. Yeah. And so there's right now, the CAR-T, for example, is a, you know, it's a treatment approach that, you know, is being watched very carefully by those who pay for those bills. Because, you know, the cost of that is, um, uh, can be astronomical, uh, and, and yet the benefits are, are you know, to the right, you know, the patients that are selected properly, or you know, fantastic benefits. But again, we've got we've got issues in the United States with how to pay for all that, um, and so that's that. Again, that's part of the perspective that I've had over the years is that you know, there's some there's 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 a need for understanding that what the the technology can bring to medicine and healthcare. And then also an understanding of you know, how do you pay for it, how do you pay for those advances in a way that um, that you know th that the broad spectrum of people could benefit from it, yeah. as opposed to just a few. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Thank you so much. Okay, so Thank one you. of you guys, so Hannah, Sonny. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Masters in surgery. Um, I'm studying islet cell transplantation and type 1 diabetes. Um, and I think what drew me to this course is that I was interested in where we are going from here and how to harness um, technological advances that are coming for um, the betterment of society rather than just advances for the sake of advancement. And how do we like translate those advancements into like things like better healthcare, better medicine, that type of thing. So it's actually interesting that you brought up accessibility because that's something that I'm very interested in. Like, how do we ensure that um, new advances are, you know, cheap enough to be available to the masses rather than just a select few? Um, is that something that we should consider? That you know, isn't that just an extension of how we have society today? That the rich get the benefits and the poor just kind of have whatever. That kind of um, interplay is something right. that I'm really interested in. Yeah, no, it's, and that's going to be, you know, that those questions are be harder, are going to be harder and yeah. harder to answer as we yeah. move in, into the future. And um, the divide gets even better. But we're, we're struggling with that now, mm -hmm. is how to pay for everything for sure. that, we, that we have available to us. Um, you know, in the case of the Canadian system, as I understand it, yeah. a lot of that, a lot of that is regulated by access, right? Yeah. In other words, if you, so if you only have 10 MRI machines, there's only so many MRI, MRIs are going to do yeah. in a month. Yeah. Uh, whereas, for, for example, in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, there are more MRI machines than in all of Canada today. Wow. And so that's you know, crazy. So, that, so access and affordability are, so are really issues. important questions yeah. to be thinking about, along with the technology advances. For sure. Yeah. That's good stuff. 
stuff. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> student. Um, my interest is kind of two areas. So I'm doing my thesis in tissue engineered heart valves, but I'm also from a rural area in Montana and something that has really all, always drew my interest is telehealth. And I know it's used more widely in Canada, um, but it's not used that widely in the U.S., which in states like Montana where the cities tend to have the best health care or the only health care. I was like, it'd be a good idea to use that in states like Montana yeah. or Wyoming. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, have you heard of a company um, uh, by the name of Teladoc? I have not, no. Okay. It might be worth your looking them up uh, on online. You know, it's, it's a, it's probably the first, uh, large, what I would call large scale uh, and mostly successful telehealth, you know, sort of forum uh, you know, that's been developed to for-profit, you know, company that allows patients to sign, you know, sign up for services and then typically they need to talk with a, a family doctor or a dermatologist or whatever, then they can access that, you know, through Skype or FaceTime or what have you. And, um, you know, and that, that's a real attempt to deliver those kind of, that kind of telehealth services, you know, to the population. Again, it's still not how most people get their care yeah. in the states, but it's still a, a pretty substantial step step forward in that. Um, it's interesting that you know telemedicine per se, and what physicians in the states can do across state lines is one of the limit limiting factors, I, I'm sure you may be aware of this from your experience in Montana, it's one of the limiting factors uh, in terms of allowing you know, broad expertise or very specialized expertise to move from one place to another because if I'm not licensed in, in the state of New Hampshire, for example, uh, I, I can give somebody, somebody else advice there, but I can't prescribe a treatment there. Um, and so, so, the, so there are some, we have some natural barriers to how telehealth can be effective in this country, but I still think there's a good future for it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for the tissue engineering, it's like specifically I do heart valves, but in general, what do you think the biggest hurdle is to overcome approval of using tissue engineered anything in actual medicine instead of just clinical trials and things like that? I didn't hear. So she, she's asking what are the main uh, barriers to making tissue engineering approaches uh, mainstream and not just sort of ad hoc and out of the main planning of medicine. Can you hear us? We can't hear him. Oh, so okay. Hear him. So I guess we. Oh, yeah, I, I okay. can hear you. Now. Okay. Yeah, yeah I had, and I did, I did hear that before. I'm sorry, I muted it there. Um, yeah, you know, I guess it, the tissue engineering that you're talking about is, um, I probably, I would probably need a better understanding of where that, what the state of the art is on that today. Although, um, I'm, I'm thinking again that there's there are issues around you know cost and affordability and 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 the, the, the question of whether the, this type of expertise is broadly available for example you know should I do a lot of work in these areas in the cancer centers MD Anderson or Sloan Ketter and so on but but you know in uh, you know in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, or Baltimore, Maryland. Well, Baltimore's got Hopkins, but in, in a lot of places, you know, there's probably just you know not um, the um, you know the, the basis for having the technology available yet. Um, so I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh -huh.
Hey, Kim, what is a master's in surgery? So, a uh, master's in surgery, they're uh, graduate students. So, sometimes it's like a step toward getting into medical school, right? You finish your undergraduate work, and you're almost the kind of person that medical schools would take, but not quite. So you try to sort of buff yourself up. <laughs> so sometimes getting a, yeah. getting a master's is a really good way to, and the, uh, the admissions committees also believe that more mature students are better. There's no evidence for this, but they all sort of hold this belief. So when they look at you, they're thinking, yeah, you'd be good now, but you'd be so much better in a year or two. So you and they are trying to find something useful to do for that two years while, while you come up to that level of you know, maturity that they're looking for. So some, that's sometimes what it is. There are other people who don't pursue the MD route, but you know, go on to a PhD and so on. Sure, understood. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I get that. A number of my friends in medical school were had had difficulty getting into school, and you know, took a year or two postgraduate studies, and then were able to populate <coughs> like the Jefferson. So, yeah, um, contrast contrast that with um, they had they had a six year program there, Kim, uh, where essentially. The Penn State students would take two years of undergraduate at Penn State, and then go immediately into medical school. So, so there most of us were 23 or 24 years old when we were going into medical school. These folks were 19 or 20, yeah. and uh, for the most part, they they did well academically, um, but I think struggled with with clinical duties, uh, you know, for periods of time. But one of them, um, just a quick aside, one of them is now the uh, uh, chairman of uh, urology at Barnes Jewish Christian Hospital in mm -hmm. at the Washington University, and probably one of the leading authorities in, on prostate cancer in the country mm -hmm. today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, you know that 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 I I spend all my days surrounded by young people and there is, there is nothing you know that they can't do really you know it isn't like that until they're 30 they're sort of idiots who can't be trusted with any no I mean there's lots of lots of evidence now that people in their early 20s can start multi-billion dollar companies and all sorts of things so it's it's hard to know this you know maturity what you're really waiting for very young people believe themselves to be immortal the idea of them dying just doesn't mean anything but generally by by the age of 14 15 you're kind of beyond that you accept that you are going to die and you know mortality is a real thing so beyond that there there's no the theoretical reason to kind of wait until people are 21, 22, 23, 24, you know. But still, a lot of people like this, uh, you know, maturity idea. Well, you're, you you would agree to stay with us until three or four your time, and it's <coughs> almost that, so, I, so I'd like to thank That's you. Right. Very, very much. Yep. I, I think this has worked uh, much better than I thought. I, I can imagine, first of all, that you might be really bored. That, that was my, my biggest fear. And that the, you know, you know technology would just wreck things. <laughs> you know, we, we, we kind of we salvaged that at the last minute. Huh? Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm proud of the way that we did that. So. So anyway, yeah. Same. yeah. So thank well, you. Well, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, I'll I'll send you the link to the video and and I think it'll it'll be one of our most interesting sessions. And I also uh, recommend to you the next one that we're doing with um, uh, 
David Pierce. He um, is one of the founders of uh, transhumanism. He uh, believes in resetting the what he calls the uh, hit, uh, hedonic set point. So right now we go from sort of pain to mild pleasure most days. And he's thinking that whole scale could be shifted. So there's no pain, just various grades of pleasure, right? And, and uh, so, and, and he also believes that the world would be a much better place if women were in charge of everything. And the, the you know, the evidence for that is sort of overwhelming, that they're less uh, territorial and, you know, it, it actually, he realizes, it isn't really practical to do that, but it is fun to talk to talk about how how that kind of world would be much better than the world that we have uh, today. And then on the fifth, Shauna Panja is talking about uh, resilience in the next hundred years. So, in her undergraduate years, she was in the area of neuroscience, and then she ended up training as a neurosurgeon, but she's a very creative, innovative person. And that really doesn't mix with uh, like training in the operating room. The operating room is a very sort of rigid, unyielding uh, educational forum. So she ultimately had to change, and, and so now she's in uh, uh, family medicine. That was a big change, because her whole self-concept was always that she was going to be a brain surgeon. She was always going to be a brain surgeon, you know, and there, there, there really wasn't a, a plan B, but now, now there is. So she's... Um, speaking here next Thursday, and then we're going out for uh, dinner in our revolving restaurant. Edmonton only has one revolving <laughs> restaurant, so, so that, right. that's what we're doing next Thursday. So look, once again, thank you very much, and I'll stay in touch with you, and uh, you can decide whether this should, could, it is intended to be a once-in-a-lifetime thing or whether you might, uh, you know, come back again for future sure. Um, sure. students. We, we teach this course both terms and we even have a poetic and musical spin-off in between terms, so we're, we're kind of always teaching it. So, once again, well, uh, thank yeah, you. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and uh, uh, I appreciate your, your reconnecting uh, after 47 years. It was yeah, yeah. Quite yeah. a surprise. And, yeah. and I, and again, I'm, I'm more than a little bit curious about what, what you're up to here. And I'm starting to get bits and pieces of it together. So uh, <laughs> thanks for thanks for your time today. And okay. Enjoy meeting your, well, meeting, but, enjoy your, meeting your students too. Yeah, may, maybe the last thing to tell you is that I have 1,300 videos on YouTube, and, but it's up to you how, how, how much of that content you end up watching. You, you don't have to end, end up watching any of it, but there's, there's, there's a lot there and a lot more all the time. So once again, thank you very, very much for a very successful Skype interaction. I'm deeply grateful to you for that. So. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Have a good evening. Okay. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Yep. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Cool. All right. So any questions? or um, Was this what you thought it was going to be like? I had no idea what, what it was going to be like. But anyway, for David Pierce, please look at some of the previous videos. You'll find them very interesting. He's a very neat guy. Maybe the funniest time is when I talk to him about haircuts. He's never had a haircut in his life. I mean, not a you know professional haircut. Never been to a barber. So you you can imagine. <laughs> he, he's he he really marches to the beat of a different uh, drummer. You'll 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 enjoy him. But he loves interacting with you guys. And uh, so if you have 
friends or other people who might like to come to the class, that's fine. It's also fine if we have just this group. It's not that I'm dissatisfied with you, it's just it would also be okay if there were more of you. So anyway, that's that's the deal. Okay, well I guess that's it for today then. Thank you. Thank you.